in the TED style, every, every talk is, is supposed to have one uh, main idea, one big idea. Uh, whether my idea is uh, small uh, or big, whether it's uh, beautiful or uh, wise <clears throat> is a matter of perspective. <clears throat> uh, my eyes aren't good, so it all looks like Marilyn Monroe to me. But, uh. <laughs> but, uh, but at least my main idea is short. Uh, be like the bee. In this metaphor, the, the bee is this event. Education enables cross-pollination. Uh, but the bee is also you and me after we leave here. As we become more educated, we can be bees that cross-pollinate. Uh, if we are Christians, we need to be grounded in a church. Um, but moving about, we can also learn and pass on learning. And, and this is the opening talk, so I'm going to try and situate neo-anabaptism in, in, in the stream of 2,000 years of church history and global Christianity. So, uh, but the main idea, the, the small idea, is be like the bee. Uh, I'm going to pursue uh, this cross-pollination idea. You'll either love it or, or hate it by the, by the, in the next 20 minutes. But, uh, but I'm going to suggest three ways that neo-anabaptism can cross-pollinate with other Christian groups. And my three examples of cross-pollination will be community, discipleship, and Christology. But first, what are we talking about when we say neo-anabaptism? And where is all the buzz about neo-anabaptism coming from? <clears throat> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, culturally speaking, uh, excitement about neo-anabaptism could be a reaction to what's going on in Western culture. In an age of individualism, anabaptism is communally minded. In an age of consumerism, it embraces, it embraces simplicity. In an age of facades, it offers authenticity. In an age of cynicism, I can unironically profess my love for Jesus. Uh, if culturally it looks like a reaction to, then theologically it seems to me to be a continuation of. A continuation of what? Uh, I would say a continuation of, uh, yes, uh, the life of Jesus, yes, 16th century Anabaptism, but more immediately a continuation of part of the Jesus movement of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, that's when Ron Sider wrote Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger, and John Yoder wrote The Politics of Jesus, and Art Gish and Bernard Eller of the, of the Church of the Brethren were also writing them. I'm not saying everybody was reading them, uh, but some people were, and their ideas were like seeds uh, waiting to flower later. Uh, so what do we all know about the Jesus movement? Most of you weren't alive then, maybe, but, uh, <clears throat> but in, the, in the flow of history, uh, we can see the Jesus movement as an example of the restoration tradition. Uh, no creed but Christ, uh, no book but the Bible, no law but love, uh, no baptism but immersion in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in the flow of history, uh, the Jesus movement is also an example of revival. Uh, the global Pentecostal and charismatic revival that started in India uh, and Wales and Los Angeles about 100 years ago, uh, comes back to California and hits some of the hippies. And uh, in the flow of history, the Jesus movement adds to restoration and revival two new words, uh, 1960s words. Anybody want to guess what they are? <laughs> two R words, two R words. Revolutionary and... Uh, you Radical, yeah, yeah. Radical and revolutionary. Uh, radical and revolutionary now enter the Christian vocabulary. I, I think it's not until uh, 1962 that we get the term radical revolution to describe earlier Anabaptists. <clears throat> uh, in terms of conviction and uh, ideology, a lot of the Jesus freaks back then could resemble uh, dunker punks or neo-anabaptists of today. Uh, listen to this list of seven traits of a naked Anabaptist. This is uh, 
the non-creedal creed of Stuart Murray. Uh, <clears throat> and I think it's the most often cited definition of what New Anabaptists believe. Uh, one, uh, you believe in Jesus. He is your example, teacher, friend, redeemer, and Lord. Two, you believe the Bible is all about Jesus. Everything in the Bible relates to Jesus. He is the focal point of God's revelation. Three, you want to be free from civil religion and all that the word Christendom implies. Four, you believe the gospel is good news to the poor. Five, you believe in community, communal accountability, and perhaps even communes. Uh, six, you see virtue and simple living. And seven, you are committed to peace, to finding nonviolent alternatives to violence. If all seven of these traits could be found among some people in the Jesus movement, then what happens to these people? Uh, well, some of them are still living in the common purse communities uh, they started back then. If you go to Reba Place in Chicago, uh, for example, you can see the homes are still there. Even a beanbag chair or two, still there. <coughs> uh, but overall, generally speaking, any movement needs to have a guiding force or energy to keep moving uh, from one generation to the next. Jesus is the center, yes. But, uh, but how do we know Jesus today? And how do we come to live a Christ-shaped life? There seem to be three basic answers to this question. Uh, and we can combine the three, but let's separate them first. Uh, some Christians, many Christians, would say the answer is uh, the holy tradition. Holy tradition is how we know Jesus and following the church's holy tradition is how we come to live a Christ-shaped life. Of the 2.4 billion people who say they are Christian, uh, one half, 1 1.2 billion are Roman Catholic and about 300 million are Eastern Orthodox. Uh, for Catholics and Orthodox, Jesus did not write books. Uh, but he did start the church, and they see their church as carrying on an unfolding but unbroken holy tradition that started in 33 AD. If you ask them when their church started, that's what, that's what they'll say. And, and the Roman Catholic Church has, of course, outlived all governments and institutions ever. <clears throat> in the holy tradition, the Bible has the place of primacy, but the tradition also includes creeds, councils, liturgies, lives of saints, and icons. Uh, some creeds were written before the Bible, as we know. Uh, some of the Jesus people started evangelical churches and then decided the, whole, the entire church should become Eastern Orthodox. Uh, Peter Gilquist of Campus Crusade. And, uh, not huge numbers of you know, such converts, but the proverbial race has a tortoise. And, uh, now, in the cross-pollination process, what can Anabaptists learn and what can we impart or teach to people who embrace holy tradition? I think we can teach about community. Uh, my mother became a convert to Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, and then she would say, uh, uh, you Protestants, because you know after you're Orthodox, all Protestants look vaguely alike, uh, you, you Protestants need to teach us about pastoral care. In the holy tradition in the first centuries, there are examples of Christians traveling to some city where there's some plague breaking out and they would go just to take care of the people there knowing they would probably get sick and die themselves. Uh, but today, the kind of tangible love that visits the sick, washes feet, sets aside pride, shares money, uses power to help the weak, uh, empower the weak. This kind of love is so needed and so often lacking in the empty, lonely, populated city. So you might, in a vision or a dream, hear a voice saying, hey, Anabaptist, come over here and help us. It could be the voice of holy tradition saying, help us have the kind of Jesus-centered community that we can see with our eyes and our hands can touch so that the word of life becomes tangible. If Anabaptism has something to teach, I think also, and I say this respectfully, I, I hope, uh, it also has something to learn from holy tradition. 
something to learn about community. It can teach visible community, <laughs> but learn invisible community. In the holy tradition, the community is not just the people you can see and hug. The church community includes uh, thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, uh, and, uh, and it includes people, people who have departed this earth, but whose spirits are still part of the church, as Hebrews 12 says. After my mom died, uh, a member of her church came to me at the funeral. He said, well, we will miss your mother, uh, but of course, she is still with us every time we celebrate the Eucharist, if we rightly discern the body. If we have this sense of community, it also shapes our sense of accountability. You don't change the holy tradition just to be creative uh, or even democratic because this particular group got together and took a vote, or even because the Supreme Court took a vote. Uh, the humility of orthodoxy is a sense of community that says we have to be absolutely certain before we go against 2,000 years of church teaching. Uh, <clears throat> because we are accountable to those people and also we are accountable to all the believers around the world today. Uh, our African sisters and brothers may not think the West is the foremost authority on social justice. So in the cross-pollination process, we have something to teach and also something to learn about community, uh, visible and invisible, from those who locate themselves within holy tradition. How do we know Jesus today, and how do we live a Christ-shaped life? Here's a second answer. Uh, some Christians, many Christians would say, the Holy Spirit is how we come to know Jesus and to live a Christ-shaped life. All Trinitarian Christians believe the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, but between 500 million and 1 billion people are Pentecostal or charismatic. Uh, Pentecostals are harder to count because outside the U.S., uh, many Catholics are also Pentecostal or charismatic. Uh, Pentecostals say it is the Holy Spirit who brings Jesus out of the remoteness of history so we can meet him today. Pentecostals say we can carry on the powerful acts that he began to do. We can pray with power and heal and prophesy and speak in tongues of people and angels. In the cross-pollination process, what can Anabaptism learn and what can we impart or teach to people who embrace the Holy Spirit, Pentecostals in particular. I think we can teach about discipleship. After the Holy Spirit comes upon people on Azusa Street in 1906, uh, some interesting things happen. For example, black women ministers were laying hands on white men so they could receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, an example of racial reconciliation you don't see every day, even today. Uh, but a Pentecostal professor told me recently, in effect, uh, hey, Anabaptists, come over here and help us remember discipleship. Help us Pentecostals reclaim our pacifist roots, for example. Pentecostals care about power, and Anabaptists can teach that Jesus gave power in order to be disciples. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why? So that you can be my witnesses or martyrs. Same word in Greek, Acts 1, be disciples. We can teach that the purpose of power is discipleship. The power is not just to give me health and wealth, but power is given to love others, as Romans 5 says. Now, if Anabaptists have something to teach, then I think we also, uh, and I say this respectfully, have something to learn about discipleship. We can teach that the purpose of the power is discipleship, but we can learn or relearn that the source of the power is not the disciples. The power does not come from me or we or the human community. 
we can learn or relearn that the power to be disciples comes from being baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus tells them to go back to Jerusalem. You're not ready to go anywhere yet, he says. Wait until you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Anabaptists can learn or relearn that discipleship is not I or we working up love for our neighbor, but rather it is the love of the Holy Spirit poured into our hearts, flowing through us. Why? To love Jesus. According to Matthew 25, he is the first neighbor. And, and this is the thing, maybe the only thing, that keeps charity from becoming paternalistic or self-congratulatory or condescending. It's not about those people being disadvantaged so much as disciples being so privileged. I mean, we get to offer food and clothing to Jesus. A young man went to Mother Teresa in Calcutta and said, I have a vocation to work with the lepers. I, I want to give my life to them. Nothing attracts me more than that. And she says, well, I think you're somewhat wrong. Our vocation consists in belonging to Jesus, and the work is just a way to express our love for him. Belong to Jesus, love him, and he will give you the means to express that love and belonging. Of course, she was married to him. Uh, but that's discipleship as Jesus meant it. Not just using him as a 2,000-year-old example, but continually relating to him through the Holy Spirit. So neo-Anabaptists have something to teach and also something to learn about discipleship. How do we come to know Jesus today and how do we live a Christ-shaped life? Here's a third answer. Many Christians would say Holy Scripture is how we know Jesus and live a Christ-shaped life. Holy Scripture is the foundation uh, for most of the world's 800 million Protestants, including Anabaptist groups such as uh, Brethren, Amish, Hutterites. Am I forgetting? Oh, Mennonites. It's so easy to forget them, yes. <clears throat> it's an inside joke, and I'm not even on the inside. So. In the cross-pollination process, what can neo-Anabaptists learn and what can we teach about the Holy Scriptures, even to older Anabaptists? I think we can teach Christology. Is this a new word to anybody? No. Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? They've just been to seminary, so they say, essentially, you want to know our Christology. No, but that's what it is. Okay. Uh, Neo-Anabaptists can help older Anabaptists see the person of Jesus and how radiantly attractive he is. They didn't drop their nets and follow him because they had learned it was their Christian duty. This radical way of life grew out of desire more than duty, it seems. So you may, in a vision or a dream, hear a voice of some worn-out dunker pastor saying, uh, hey, neo-Anabaptists, come over here and help us to be more desire-propelled and less duty-fatigued. Neo-Anabaptists can help Holy Scripture-based people read those red letters and exclaim, yeah, let's just do this. Let's go for it. Drop everything. <laughs> Life is short. Because of previous cross-pollination, neo-Anabaptists can help Holy Scripture-based people hear Jesus speaking through the Bible. Speaking sometimes just by reading the same passage three times slowly. Speaking not just by longer and longer sermons, but maybe longer and longer periods of silence. If neo-Anabaptists can teach about the humanity of Jesus, then in the cross-pollination process, what is there to learn or, or not lose sight of? 
I would say the divinity of Jesus. Older Anabaptist traditions and other scripture-based people see the divine person of Jesus and how radiantly attractive his death is. They see that he is fully God as well as fully human. It's eternally settled, as the older Anabaptist said. Jesus is Lord of the universe. Murray calls Jesus our example, teacher, friend, redeemer, and Lord. Uh, but maybe the last two get short shrift in his book. Redeemed from what by what? The word sin does not appear in the book. The word salvation only twice and only to describe how reformers differed from Anabaptists. A diminished Christology is, I would say, and I hope respectfully, is, is a diminished or shrunken Anabaptism. Anytime the gospel gets boiled down to ethics, uh, even that tends to evaporate. <laughs> if we embrace that Jesus is both fully human and fully God, both finite and infinite, both temporal and eternal, completely imminent and totally transcendent. If we embrace that mystery of incarnation, then it, it shapes the mind to apprehend other scriptural paradoxes. For example, that his life-filled death defeats the power of death. That on the cross, the righteous judge is judged in our place. And that the blood of Christ makes peace. If we have a purely modern, rational understanding of peace or atonement, or baptism for that matter, we may not be doing justice to the deep justice of God. I'm just offering that to, to contemplate. Uh -huh. When in Kenya with a group of students, we listened to a Kenyan choir sing over and over, Oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes me whiter than snow. What do these Africans know about the whiteness of snow? And why are they singing something so culturally inappropriate? Because they have met Jesus fully in their own culture, but in a way that transcends culture. Our prayer is also to meet Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Scriptures, in the Holy Community. The beauty of cross-pollination is that it helps us to see Christ more fully, as fully human and fully divine. Cross-pollination helps us to see discipleship as an act of the Holy Spirit. And cross-pollination helps us to see the church community as the creation of the community that is the Holy Trinity. We are here because the Spirit of Christ is here. And if joined with Jesus, then our conversation, our conversation today and tomorrow and the next day will be surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and a community that spans the world and transcends time. It's good to be firmly grounded in a particular church with people who can hug you. But it's also good to be like the bee. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Thank you.